So uh, I wanted to uh, basically talk about, I wanted, after th these, uh, the morning session talks were really fascinating and interesting, but let's get back to something simpler, like seismology. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about seismic imaging of uh, what, what are informally known as arclogites and some interesting structures that we think we're seeing uh, at the at Moho lower crustal upper mantle levels and what some of their implications might be for uh, lithospheric deformation. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author uh, Susan Beck and uh, a lot of this work uh, will be, uh, that I'll be showing you have been done by uh, other groups as well as our, our students. Hopefully I've got them, uh, most of them cited uh, during the course in the, in, the, in the slides. So this doesn't work. Sorry, no, sorry. <laughs> so the, uh, my object objectives are, are pretty straightforward for this talk. I just want to give you, show you a couple of examples how, of how we use seismic imaging to investigate the geodynamics of, of mountain buildings. And I want to show you two primary examples, one from the Sierra Nevada and one from the Andes. And I think these two areas, uh, for reasons that I'll, I'll get into a little bit, are really uh, 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 go hand in hand in, t in telling us about uh, what processes might, might have been important in the development of, of both regions. Uh, sort of in the, in the uh, 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 following the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the topics of uh, CIDR, I want to emphasize the importance of interdisciplinary inter interpretation. So although the, the primary sources of information that I want to talk about are, come from seismic imaging, uh, it'll be pretty clear, I think, that to interpret those seismic images, we really do have to incorporate information from other disciplines. And then uh, the results of, the, of, of these, uh, some of these investigations, I think, are, are, gonna, are giving us some interesting, perhaps new information about how, how continental lithosphere deforms. And I'm talking principally about the deeper levels, at the lower crustal upper mantle levels, and um, so I want to start out with some, just some ba a basic overview of, of different types of uh, seismic data. And of course, the, one of the principal ways that uh, seismologists sort of divide up their uh, discipline is between active source and passive source. And the basic uh, difference is that active source are man-made sources, generally. Um, and you know, you've, you've heard about reflection seismology and refraction seismology. Uh, with enough act with sources and enough receivers, you can do tomography with it. Passive seismology or natural source seismology, some pe people prefer, utilizes earthquakes as sources. And uh, you've seen, uh, you will see in a lot more detail in later talks how surface waves are used to do tomography, uh, what receiver functions are, waveform modeling, and as we go to even bigger sources, uh, they generate free oscillations which can be utilized to study the stru uh, structure of the whole Earth. Um, and each of these techniques tend to have their, uh, their um, advantages and, and disadvantages. They tend to be sensitive to slightly different things. And some of, some of those differences are illustrated in this slide from uh, David Okaya that he put together. Now this, this is not uh, an easy thing to do in one slide, but it gives you the basic flavor is that the different kinds of techniques uh, record data of different frequencies or, or wavelengths. And um, because of that, they're sensitive to different uh, length scales of heterogeneity or structures in the Earth. Now, these, these are just, this is just a legend for, uh, for these uh, elliptical circles or these, uh, these uh, symbols up here. 
So for example, the, the red uh, ellipse up here represents teleseismic and, uh, tomography and receiver functions. Uh, the light blue one might be a crust, uh, data from crustal refraction and reflection, et cetera. And I, d I don't want to get into the detail. And then the upper bound is, is based on utilizing P waves, and the lower bound is uh, based on utilizing S waves. And I don't want to get into all the details of this, but the basic idea is that uh, the higher frequency your sources and data are, the smaller wavelength or the smaller length scales that you can investigate. Uh, uh, conversely, the longer the wavelength, uh, the, uh, the larger the length scales you can investigate. And uh, one of the advantages of using this is that it doesn't actually even see some of these smaller wavelengths, uh, smaller scales. And so you can see through some of the complexities that we know exist in the upper part of the crust and look at larger scale features in the, the deeper part of the crust or mantle. Um, and so, uh, uh, one of the uh, ultimate goals of seismologists is is to combine everything <laughs> in one spot and be able to image uh, all the different wave, wave, uh, wavelengths and uh, scales of structures in one location. We haven't uh, quite gotten there yet. More technical question. Yeah. How far yeah. can actually, what kind of broad band do they actually have? No. Uh, it depends on the kind of... it at one station? Uh, the, the sort of the broadest band uh, seismometers that are generally used in mostly in passive uh, type uh, situations go from, uh, can go from tens of hertz to hundreds of seconds. The, 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 that's what we call broadband seismology. And it's, those kinds of seismometers are generally used in passive type uh, uh, seismology. Uh, at the other end, uh, uh, in active source seismology, you know, they, they have uh, geophones that can go to very high frequencies, that, that can record up to very high frequencies. The trick here is to have sources that generate these high, high, uh, high frequencies. So yeah, please, uh, please stop me anytime. In fact, you'll make me feel more comfortable if you ask questions along, along the way. So. Very, I mean, I think there are going to be later talks that will go into a, a lot more detail about these techniques. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview. I'm going to show you today some results from both seismic tomography using both body waves, not at the same time, but some body wave tomography results, surface wave tomography results, and some receiver function uh, results. So I want to make sure that everybody has at least a first order understanding of the differences between those. And seismic tomography, uh, I think most of you know this technique has been around for a long time. Uh, it uses the same principles of a, as a CAT scan. Basically, you have sources of, uh, of energy that uh, interrogate the medium and uh, have different, uh, interrogate the medium at, with different angles and different directions and different azimuths. And if you, if you have that recorded at, uh, uh, at a, a number of sensors, these uh, sources recorded at a number of sensors, you can, where, where you have crisscrossing rays, you can resolve what the velocity uh, uh, structure is in that, uh, in that region. Now, they're, they're using, even using body waves, there's at least two main types of uh, tomography. Uh, tele using teleseismic waves or using local earthquakes in which you try to relocate the earthquakes as well as determine the, the, the structure in the medium. The important difference between the two is that in the teleseismic technique, you can only resolve uh, velocity perturbations. You can't resolve absolute velocities because there's a trade-off with uh, uh, unknown possible errors in the locations of the earthquakes. So whenever uh, you look at a teleseismic tomography image, uh, what you generally are looking at are perturbations from an initial one, uh, 1D velocity model. Uh, we know the, for most of the Earth, we know the average 
radial velocity structure reasonably well on, on a global scale. And so we utilize that to trace the rays through the Earth model. And then the, uh, the residuals that we see between the observed and predicted travel times of those rays are then inverted to uh, determine velocity perturbations from that starting model. So those images are usually have uh, uh, contours in, in terms of percent perturbations from, from that initial model. Uh, with local tomography, where you're relocating the earthquakes, you can actually invert for the absolute velocities. So when you look at uh, velocity images from local tomography, in general, you also see the earthquakes that were used as sources. And you can uh, often the contours in terms of absolute velocities. Although sometimes these are also shown in perturbation form uh, in order to bring out the anomalies uh, in, in more detail. Uh, another point is that tomography can also be done with surface waves. And uh, those uh, also can retrieve uh, absolute uh, velocities. Surface waves are mostly sensitive to shear velocities. And body waves, you can either use uh, P waves or S waves and get images of both. The, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out about tomography is it comes in all kinds of scales, from global scales to regional scales to local scales. And this, the other thing to look at, uh, and an important thing when you're looking at tomographic images, is, is to look at the scale and see what the perturbations are. And on a, on, a, on a whole global scale, obviously you're averaging over much larger volumes of the Earth. So the perturbations tend to be relatively small, you know, like minus, in this case, it's my, for, it goes from minus 1.5% to plus 1.5%. So this basic, uh, so to, to interpret these types of image, images, remember you're looking at lateral variations. The 1D structure has been removed. And so this basically says that at the core mantle boundary, this location is fast compared to this location, which is slow. And uh, it doesn't mean that the core mantle boundary is faster here than, uh, or it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that, that this fast anomaly is faster in velocity than here because there's a very strong vertical gradient that's been removed from this image. Uh, regional, uh, Can you that again? <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, this says, uh, this says that uh, this is, you know, the blue is a 1.5% fast and the pinks are 1.5% slow. And if you just read that directly, you might say, okay, uh, this part of the Earth right above the uh, uh, 670 discontinuity is faster than the velocity at the core mantle boundary. That's not true. I mean, it, all this says is that uh, this part of the, uh, the layer is faster than this part, okay? And down here it says this part of the core mantle boundary is slower than this part. Okay. And now, we often make the assumption that if we see a continuous anomaly through the mantle that represents a continuous feature, but there is a strong velocity gradient, a vertical radial gradient, that's been removed from this image. Are there any absolute images? Yes. <laughs> there are absolute images. For example, if, uh, uh, if you do surface wave tomography, you can actually retrieve the absolute velocities. And so uh, those do retrieve absolute velocities. But often they're also shown as perturbations because you know, the vertical gradient is so strong that sometimes overwhelms the, the image. And so to accentuate the, uh, the anomalies, uh, people often remove the, the, the average velocity structure from the, from the image. So uh, similarly, uh, regional, uh, I guess I didn't put the scale on this, but this is like plus or minus 3%. So as you go to a smaller and smaller scale, the anomalies tend to, tend to get larger and larger. Because we're imaging smaller regions, we're not averaging over large, as large an area, so we tend to see more details. So uh, 
This is uh, 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 some image our group has done in the Flas Lab region. I'll, th I'll be talking about this later, Flas Lab region of the Sierra Pampianas. And here we've done body, uh, local tomography. You can see the earthquakes that we were utilized. And you can see uh, these contours are uh, absolute velocity contours of P velocity and S velocity. So, you know, there's a lot of details that, uh, and complexities of generating these images. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, other people presumably will later uh, and, and talk about how these images are obtained and what their resolution limits are and things like that. But uh, I want to focus on what they might be telling us about the Earth. Oh, the other technique I'll be uh, talking about are receiver functions. These two have become quite common and are, are generally well known, but let me just briefly uh, explain them. Receiver functions uh, also can be done uh, with uh, teleseismic waves. But here, instead of utilizing their travel time, we're looking at the travel time difference between uh, uh, the direct P wave, for example, that uh, comes to a station, and a P to S conversion. Anytime a wave interacts with the impedance contrast, or in other words, uh, uh, a, a, a layer where the velocity and density changes, if it, interest, if it hits that interface uh, at an angle that's less than orthogonal, it generates a converted wave. P waves generate converted S waves. S waves generate converted P waves. And <clears throat> if you can isolate those converted waves from your seismogram, the difference between the arrival time of the P wave and the arrival time of that S wave P and S waves travel at different speeds, uh, must be related to the depth to the interface at which that converted wave was generated. That's, so that's the basic idea of receiver functions. Uh, and so presumably, if, if the Earth is, as, as I said already, that the strongest velocity gradients are, are in the radial direction or vertical direction, uh, uh, as, an, as a teleseismic P wave comes up to a station, it should be generating a sequence of converted S waves that arrive uh, uh, later and later, uh, depending on the depth at, at, at uh, depth at which they were generated. Okay. The trick in receiver functions is isolating these uh, converted waves. They, Remember, the, the conversion coefficient at these kinds of interfaces are on the order of 10% or something. And so their, their amplitudes are, are generally much smaller than the direct P wave. And so the trick is trying to isolate them through a deconvolution process. But uh, there's a number of ways that people have developed to, to, to do that. Now, it's very important to remember the receiver functions are sensitive uh, to wave speed discontinuities. And uh, the way that they're sensitive to it is, is very simple. Um, I, as I already said, the, the depth is related to the timing difference between the first arriving P wave and the arrival time of the converted S wave. The deeper the depth, the longer this time interval. And of course, that's a function. This is a P wave and this is an S wave. So it's dominantly controlled by the average VPVS between the interface and the surface, the VPVS ratio. Uh, the amplitude of this uh, converted P wave, uh, S wave is dependent on the size of the discontinuity, the, mag uh, the magnitude of the discontinuity. Obviously, the bigger the velocity difference, the larger the converted wave amplitude. Uh, the frequency content, or the width of the uh, converted wave, is actually sensitive to the, the uh, width of the gradient, uh, or the thickness of the gradient, uh, in, uh, which is the, the depth range over which the velocity uh, increases 
from uh, this velocity to this velocity. So sort of by looking at the frequency content or the width of the, the, uh, the converted wave, we can uh, say something about the, how, what the gradient of the, of the uh, discontinuity is. And the other really nice thing about it is that they're just as sensitive to, I mean, uh, it's sensitive to uh, changes in uh, the polarity of the discontinuity. So we can tell the difference between a velocity increase with depth or a velocity decrease with depth depending on the polarity of the converted wave. So this is a technique. It turns out low velocity zones are some, sometimes very difficult to see with travel times because we usually pick the first arrival. First arrivals tend to find the fastest path from point A to point B. They, they tend to skirt around low velocity zones. So uh, uh, travel time tomography, it's, a, it's harder to find low velocity zones than high velocity zones in general. That's, I mean, with enough data, you can, you can find them. But receiver functions are just as sensitive to low velocity zones as, as, as high velocity zones. Uh, with enough data, uh, you can do something uh, called common conversion point stacking. This is very similar to, uh, uh, what is it called? In common midpoint mid stacking, thank you. In, in active source size, in reflection seismology, uh, a way to improve your signal to noise is to have a lot of sources uh, recorded at different stations. And if, they, if the geometry of the ray path is such that they reflect at the same point, then you can stack those traces together and increase your signal to noise ratio. That's called common midpoint uh, stacking. It's used a lot in, uh, in, uh, in, in industry to, to improve their resolution. We can do a very similar kind of thing with uh, receiver functions, uh, much rougher scale, obviously. But if we have a series of stations that are close together, recording uh, uh, receiver function or recording receiver functions from different directions and azimuths, uh, we can divide the we can grid up the medium be beneath the array of stations, and uh, whenever we have ray paths, and then we can uh, trace the rays back down through the earth. Uh, the receiver function, fun if we have a velocity model, we can, we can follow, we can sort of determine where those uh, receiver functions were sampling the, the Earth. And where we have two ray paths that are close enough together, we can stack the uh, amplitudes uh, 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 together. And for example, at this node, this ray path, this receiver function recorded at this station can be uh, projected down to this depth, can be added to the amplitude of, from the receiver function recorded at this station, and generate a, uh, uh, what we call a CCP stack, which, if it's done correctly, uh, should increase the signal-to-noise ratio. So the basic step is you, you back project the receiver functions along the ray paths, and you need a, a rough velocity model in order to do that. You uh, sort of deposit the receiver function amplitude at the appropriate nodes, and then you uh, average the amplitude values at each node and generate an image that might look like this. So here's another seismic image that has reds and blues on it, but this is very different from a tomography image where the reds and blues might indicate regions or volumes of high velocity and low velocity. These are uh, instead uh, indicate regions of low, am a low or high negative amplitude and uh, regions of uh, high positive amplitude. Okay, so you can see here the average uh, individual, uh, the average receiver functions for each of these nodes as the blue line here and where the uh, negative amplitudes sort of uh, exceed a certain threshold, it's uh, painted blue. 
uh, negative amplitude, and where they exceed a certain uh, uh, positive amplitude, they're painted red. But to interpret this, this is not showing you images of high, I mean, indirectly they are, but the way to interpret this is that the, in the middle of the red zone is a discontinuity where we go from low velocities to high velocities. So for example, this might be the moho. It's about the appropriate depth. It's, we, we think that mohos are, are depth uh, interfaces, dis discontinuities where the velocities increase. And, and this little blue patch might be a, a top of a low velocity zone in the crust, and this might be top of a low velocity zone in the mantle. Now there are issues with the f fact that not only are there converted phases, there are multiples. If the discontinuity is big enough, uh, you, have, you can have phases that come up and bounce around in the crust and come back and are recorded. And if you don't, if they're not, uh, and you don't immediate with, without some investigation, it's not clear immediately if what you're looking at is a primary or a multiple. And so there are uh, ways to try to distinguish between those two same kinds of problems that uh, reflection seismologists have. George, uh, yes. how strong um, velocity contrast do you need in the to show up? And the second probably is mm -hmm. Uh, the, your first question is how small can you, it depends on your signal to noise ratio. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, I would say given the, 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 in the noise in receiver functions, you would have to have something at least uh, several 5% you know, change in impedance uh, contrast in order to pull it out of the noise. But it, it really, that, you know, answer that question would depend a, a lot on, on what the noise level is and how much stacking you might be able to, to, to do uh, to, to, to pick out the, you know, the ampli small amplitude of a converted wave from the other noise that's in, in the signal. And as far as a gradient, uh, how big a gradient you, uh, you can uh, image, that depends on the, uh, on the frequency content of of the signal, the, the bandwidth of the signal. Uh, if you have enough bandwidth, uh, you should be able to resolve, you know, uh, velocity uh, gradients that are tens, uh, tens of kilometers thick. And I, I think, um, and I'll show you some examples where we, you can see that uh, that variation. I think. Any other questions? Yeah. The color scale proportional to the, the that percentage change. Yes, the color scale is uh, it's just a color palette that's uh, tied to the amplitude of the receiver function, uh, tied to the receiver function amplitude, and so um, uh, you know it, it's it's just like in regular tomography, you can saturate it or you can. You can do things with it to make it look pretty <laughs> or to emphasize what you want to emphasize. <laughs> but the key thing, and, and, and of course, like uh, every, everywhere else, uh, not everybody agrees on the color palette. <laughs> and some people uh, uh, color the, uh, the positive amplitudes blue and the negative <laughs> amplitudes red. And so you have to be a little bit uh, aware of what the color color palette is. Okay, so let's look at some examples of utilizing some of these techniques, starting in the North America Cordillera. I think um, <clears throat> everybody knows uh, uh, about our wonderful mountain system here. The, 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 the thing about it that's really interesting is that we think that from geologic and tectonic uh, geophysical studies that the North American Cordillera 50 million years ago uh, might have looked very much like the Andean Cordillera of today. Uh, 
And so we often use that, uh, those, those of us who work in the Andes often use that as a, you know, why do we, why do we care about the Andes? Because, you know, the Andes are what the Western US looked like. And so we're gonna go there and see, see what it looks like, uh, what the Western US might have looked like today. Yeah. Um, and the particular, uh, of course, the other thing that's actually, you can turn that around. Uh, if the, uh, the reason that the, the Western US, uh, North American Cordillera is so wide now is that it's collapsed. It's the Andean Cordillera that's collapsed since uh, 50 to 30 million years ago and uh, extended. Um, and in that process, it has exposed uh, in, in some areas the much deeper levels of the mountain system that existed. So of course you can turn that around and say uh, by studying uh, our backyard here, we can look at the deeper levels of what the Andes might, ha uh, Andes might look like today. And so one of those areas that's, that's uh, uh, very interesting in that respect is the Sierra Nevada range, uh, shown, uh, uh, of course, uh, here adjacent to the uh, San Joaquin Valley and uh, in this uh, uh, tectonic reconstruction map from a Dickinson paper, it was part of a, uh, a Cordillan uh, uh, extensive uh, arc system uh, that was active 90 to 100 million years ago. And uh, it's, it's extinct now as, as an, an arc, and the deeper levels of, of that arc system have been uplifted and, and exposed and so it's a great place to go study the deeper parts of a, an arc that might be a analog for the Western Cordillera of the, of the Andes. And of course, the other parts of the system that might be analogs is that the, uh, the basin and range, the Great Basin here, might be the collapsed, uh, 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 exposed uh, uh, region of the, um, of the Altiplano. Sometimes this area has been called the Nevada Plano in, in, in rec uh, recognition of that uh, analogy. And then the Rocky Mountains here are uh, often uh, thought of, uh, these are foreland uplifts in front of the severe fold and thrust belt. And so sometimes uh, these are the uh, analogs or of uh, uh, or older versions of the Sierra Pampianas in, in Argentina, although the scales are quite different. If you look at, at, the, at, at this uh, reconstructed uh, foreland uplifts compared to the present day Sierra Pampianas, uh, the distan inboard distance here in the reconstructed uh, paleospastic uh, reconstructions are probably at least twice as far inboard as the, as the modern day Sierra Pompeianas. So, uh, some observations uh, from the Western US uh, Sierra Nevada that uh, have been known for some time now. This is work that, a lot of this work came out of a continental dynamics project called the Southern Sierra Continental Dynamics uh, Project. <laughs> um, and the, uh, and it, it's, it, it's, it's a great location to study because there's a lot of information. People have been studying for <laughs> the Sierra Nevada for a long time, uh, uh, including people from this campus. You know? uh, and that we know a lot about the geology and, and the, the volcanism there and the magmatic uh, processes. And, and, and one of the key pieces of information that have led to being able to reconstruct a lithosphere column for back in the, in the Mesozoic, uh, in the Cretace late Cretaceous, uh, when this arc was active, is the discovery of uh, xenoliths that have sampled uh, not only from the, the crust, but deeper in the lower part of the crust at depths of uh, 50 to 80 kilometers, but uh, well into the mantle uh, par, uh, at 100 plus kilometers. And this is a lithosphere column uh, reconstructed by Salibi and his students. Uh, 
And the, the amazing, uh, sort of the, the thing that uh, is pretty amazing about this is, and, uh, well, in combination uh, with this uh, is an active source uh, seismic refraction, uh, reflection profile that was run across the Southern Sierra Nevada. The, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but these are absolute velocities, 6.2 kilometers per second, con contours 6.5. And then here's the moho. And what, uh, what came out of this is the realization that uh, the entire 20 to 30 kilometers of, of crust in the Sierra Nevada appears to be composed of granitoids that were emplaced and solidified in the crust uh, uh, in, in, in the Lake Cretaceous. Um, and then beneath that, there was a, the residue of the melting to, to produce these granitoids. And these residues are basically garnet peroxinites. And so the idea is, the, and, and Sue could explain this in, in much more detail than I can, but basically there's, there's two, uh, the thought is that there's, there's at least a two-stage melting process here. Melting in the mantle generates the basalts. These basalts uh, intrude into, into the crust, are emplaced into the crust, and they in turn are melted uh, and melt surrounding rocks. And that generates uh, the felsic uh, uh, magmas, the granodiorites and granites that are emplaced into the upper crust. But in that differentiation process, it leaves behind a residue uh, that consists of these uh, more mafic uh, minerals of uh, uh, pyroxenes and garnets. Okay. And this column uh, almost occupies the entire lithospheric column down to 70, 80 kilometers, although there's some gradational aspects uh, at, at depth. And so this large volume of, and, and, and certainly some of this involves reworking of pre-existing crust as well. And this large uh, uh, igneous magmatic event appears to have occurred over a relatively short amount of time. Radiometric dating of, of these uh, plutons indicate that most of, most of this volume was in place in a, uh, a, 20, uh, a 20 million year uh, time period. And uh, Duchia, I don't know if he came up with the term, but it has sort of become known as a high flux event. And um, it has a, a geochemical and isotopic characteristics that indicate that there was uh, involvement of North American cratonic uh, rocks in, in, the, in the melting zone. And uh, so this, this was known uh, uh, for some time, uh, since uh, the, uh, the, uh, the early, you know, late 90s and early 2000s. And, uh, in, in the, uh, and, and the, the thing that caught people's attention is that the xenoliths uh, that brought up these garnet peroxinites were always uh, in volcanics that were uh, Miocene age or older. Where, and all the xenoliths that were brought up in younger volcanics, uh, Pliocene, Quaternary volcanics, all, the, all of them did not show the garnet peroxinite residues. And in fact, at the depth ranges at which uh, xenoliths were brought up from the equivalent depth ranges, but those xenoliths always uh, were high temperature spinel peridotites. And so this was the place where people, based on the xenoliths in part, uh, really came up with the idea of uh, delamination. I mean, this wasn't where people came up with the idea of delamination, but this was really some of the strongest evidence that delamination occurred uh, underneath uh, magmatic arcs. Miocene xenoliths bring up garnet peroxinites from the uh, uh, you know, 40 to uh, 80 kilometer depth level. Younger Pliocene, Pleistocene xenoliths, they don't, uh, at the same depth levels, they bring up spinel peridotites. Now, Initially, there, is, there was a spatial difference between 
where these xenoliths occurred and the younger xenoliths occurred. And the very early papers by Duchi and Salibi suggested that, well, maybe the eastern part of the root, the ecclegetic root, which should exist, should exist underneath the whole batolith, was delaminated, but maybe the western part was still in place. And later, as more xenoliths were studied, there were some xenolith locations that were really close to each other that showed this difference as well, and sort of the story evolved into well, the whole root was delaminated. Well, now we have more seismic data that indicates that a large chunk of that root, prob I mean, the ecclegetic root, is probably still in place. And these are results from a newer uh, ERSCO project that we called SNP, and uh, that involved uh, deploying, uh, this is, was an earlier experiment run by Craig Jones. These blue stations were, uh, broadband stations deployed by the SNP project. And now we have uh, nice seismic images of the entire length of the Sierra Nevada. And uh, I'm just showing you one cross-section now. This is uh, determined, uh, these images were obtained from the same set of seismic stations. This is a receiver function image that shows mantle, I mean, crustal and mantle discontinuities, and for exactly the same cross-section, this is a surface wave tomography image that shows uh, absolute shear velocities. And uh, this was obtained uh, by uh, 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 Ken Duker and Josh Stashnik uh, at the University of Wyoming, and uh, combines both ambient noise and multiple plane wave uh, surface wave tomography, for those of you who know what that means. And the, the thing that, uh, that jumps out to me, at least, immediately, is here's the MOHO. And the MOHO uh, is very bright, a high amplitude, uh, underneath uh, the White Mountains uh, in the um, Owens Valley, the high peaks of the Sierra Nevada. It starts uh, deepening under the western foothills, and then it sort of disappears. And uh, by looking at the absolute velocities, you can see why underneath uh, this part of the cross section, there's low vo crustal velocities down to the moho and then the strong gradient up to mantle velocities. That's what produces this uh, high in amplitude conversion in the receiver function image. Over here, there's high crustal velocities in the lower crust. And the gradient uh, from this velocity, uh, which is about three, this is about 3.8, and this velocity, which is about 4.5, occurs over a depth range of uh, over 25 kilometers. And so this, this thick gradient really uh, makes the moho disappear. There's not a, a sudden jump to mantle velocities. It's a very thick, uh, long uh, transition to mantle velocities. Okay. And then you can see negative uh, tops of low velocity zones in both the crust and mantle on this side. And the crust is much more homogeneous looking uh, as you get into the western foothills. Now, of course, this is just we sort of we knew a, we had a hint of this from uh, from uh, previous work, of course, but this is just the opposite of what area isostasy would predict, right? Uh, where you have high velocity, uh, high elevations, you should have thick crust, and where you have low elevations, you should have thin crust, and we have just the opposite. So it must be compensated for in the mantle uh, density differences in the mantle, and people had sort of figured that out already. But this uh, just reinforces that. And, and so what is this fast stuff over here? We think this slow stuff over here is a sphenosphere. And because these are the kinds of upper mantle velocities you would expect, 4.2 is pretty slow S velocity in the upper mantle. It sort of indicates uh, that it's really hot and perhaps has some partial melt in it. 
And this material here is uh, much faster. Yeah, we, uh, we can take uh, some vertical slices through this model and look at these. So this, uh, this high blue stuff here is velocities between about, I know it, you can't read it here, in shear velocity between about 4 and 4.4 4 or something. And there's very little of that velocity over here, and there's a very thick section of that velocity uh, under the foothills. So what is that? Well, our interpretation, of course, is that this is the eclogitic root of the batholith, and it's still there. But over here, that eclogitic root has been removed and replaced by hot asthenosphere sometime in the past less than. The Miocene volcanics that bring up, oh, and I should add, the star is the location of a xenolith locality which has brought up uh, uh, garnet peroxinites uh, from this depth range about 8 million years ago. And uh, over here in the uh, Owens Valley, from the de same depth range, eclogites in Pliocene and Quaternary volcanics have brought up uh, spinel peridotites, basically. Sure. Yeah. He interpreted, or maybe I interpreted, based on what he said, that there's a transition between shallow and steep subduction, and that the, mm, yeah, the right. current right. roof is showing you, and that, that has a stripe of like to the northeast. So the shallow bit, <coughs> once that left brought a lot of this material to come in, and where it was steep, you just preserved the, the roof. Right. Is, and that, is that story still? Exist? Yeah, that story is uh, still. Um, uh, no, the uh, the transition from really shallow uh, laramite subduction to steeper, deeper laramite subduction uh, was through the sort of along the Garlock Fault, uh, southernmost part of the Sierra Nevada, and the idea there is that south of here that a laramide slab came in flat at very shallow depths, uh, just, you know, just below the crust. But here, it came in, it flattened as well, but not until, a, you know, 100 or 120 kilometers. So it preserved, this stuff was preserved by laramide flat subduction, but at, at a much uh, deeper level, than uh, the, the, the flat slab south of the Garlock Fault. Okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that, that there was a lack of, of garnet critical xenoliths from the Miocene volcanoes. You just mentioned there was some in the Pliocene. No, in the Pliocene uh, Quaternary volcanics. Did you just say that there were some? That were found right about that? Uh, uh, the, this is a Miocene uh, xenolith site, and they did bring up uh, garnet peridotites from this depth range. The quaternary ones are just to the east of it. Uh, Pliocene quaternary ones are to the east of it, and they don't bring up, yeah, they don't bring up the uh, garnet peridotites. So, are these seismic velocities appropriate for uh, magmatic residue? And the petrophysical data suggest that they, that they are. Um, uh, this is some work uh, published by Ben and Kellerman, and they looked at the physical, petrophysical properties of uh, arc uh, uh, residue rocks from the Talkeetna arc, which is an exposed arc in southern Alaska. Uh, these gabbro-norites are really uh, hydroclase-rich uh, uh, mafic rocks. And as, as uh, Greg, I think, mentioned, uh, uh, ma these types of mafic rocks, when they are under high pressures, uh, will undergo a phase uh, change to, to uh, uh, 
to uh, eclogite or to uh, pyroxenes, basically. And that causes a sudden jump in, uh, in the, its seismic uh, velocities. Um, this is uh, VP and uh, VS. It's a, this change is a function of temperature and at, the, at colder temperatures that occurs at uh, shallower levels. But at pressures about one GPA, which is about 33 kilometers, um, down, to, you know, down to two GPA uh, or one and a half GPA, these uh, phase changes occur and you obtain shear velocities in these residue type rocks uh, between four or 4.2, I think, 4.1 and 4.3 or 4.4, sort of in this, in this box here. So, and they undergo, uh, of course, become uh, uh, denser as well. And so, uh, these kinds of velocities that were seen underneath the foothills of the Sierra Nevada are the appropriate types of velocities we would, we would expect for uh, residue rocks uh, uh, associated with, with arcs. And so now looking at these uh, images along strike, I want to show you uh, three along strike images. Uh, this is a uh, uh, of course, I've tilted the Sierra Nevada on their side now. And this is a uh, northwest, southeast uh, trending cross section that goes through uh, uh, the eastern edge of the Sierra Nevada batholith. And you can see under some of the highest topography at the south, uh, at the south end, we come off into the uh, Owens Valley here. And you can see under the highest uh, topography of uh, the eastern edge of the Sierra Nevada, there's a very sharp moho uh, that extends in, along the entire length. We think this sharp moho reflects uh, a sort of delamination moho. Uh, the, the material underneath this area is low velocity, has low velocity shear waves. You can see all these blue uh, converted uh, converters that suggest localized zones of partial melt in the mantle as well in the crust and where we see some of the shallowest of these low velocity zones are where some of the active uh, quaternary volcanic uh, areas are Coso, Long Valley and Lake Tahoe okay. and so we're, we think this is we're looking at, at across a zone where the root used to exist but now, uh, sometime post-Miocene, it's been removed, and the mantle's been replaced by hot uh, asthenosphere uh, with zones of partial melt in it, feeding these crustal magma chambers that are the source of young volcanism. Oops. Um, this is a cross-section a little bit further uh, into the main body of the Sierra Nevada. And you can see uh, we still have the sharp moho suggesting that this part of, of um, the batholith has been delaminated as well, or most of it. Uh, you can see uh, there's fewer uh, blue zones, uh, fewer perhaps, maybe delaminated more recently, so the magmatic, uh, the Young magmatism hasn't developed, had a time to develop quite as much. You see earthquakes here uh, that uh, have been located in this uh, area. Uh, these are kind of interesting, kind of a pipe-like zone of earthquakes coming up uh, just south of Yosemite. And these earthquakes right at the Moho are called low-frequency events. They're characteristic of regions. Uh, uh, they're often found in the deeper part of the crust in volcanic areas, like in the Cascades. There's no active volcano in southern Yosemite, as far as I know. But uh, these earthquakes are kind of interesting. They might suggest that there may be some uh, uh, fluid-related uh, activity near the, near the base of the crust uh, that may be uh, uh, ind indicative of, uh, of some strange things going on down there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, well, these were recorded during the deployment of the SNP array. Uh, uh, when was that? Uh, we pulled out a couple of years ago. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, 2006, 2006. These have been a couple of uh, these have been uh, are occur. Uh, a couple of these have been uh, uh, recorded by the USGS uh, in part of their network. But I think we have we have stations right above these now, so we have much better locations on them. Well, they're not slow earthquakes. They're called uh, low frequency events. They they. they uh, characterized by having really low frequencies, they seem to they don't they seem to be related to most people think they're related to magmatic processes. Um, and then as we come even uh, as we come further under the foothills, the western side of the Sierra Nevada, the bright moho disappears, and uh, we have this very uh, except for the southern edge, where we where the the Sierra is sort of curve around. We think this, this part of the, the batholith has been, uh, has been delaminated. But then we come into the western foothills, and we see that the bright moho is gone. We see very uh, gradational, uh, complicated looking uh, structures. We de you see relatively deep earthquakes down to depths of 40 kilometers or more. Um, uh, those of you who know the heat flow story for the Sierra Nevada, uh, there's very low heat flow in, in this region, and there's a transition to very high heat flow uh, between these two transects. And uh, I w uh, along this transect, I'm also showing you the, uh, the S wave tomography results. And these these, so I think we're in, in now in the transect where the, we're looking at some of the uh, eclogetic root of this arc still intact or still in place. And you can see these upwarping of these contours. And, um, uh, and over on, on, on this side, when we go into the, uh, into the core, the sort of the western foothills, where there's less magmatism, we see a, uh, a more normal looking moho at about 35 kilometers depth here. And one of the interesting things is that the, you can sort of trace this feature <coughs> sort of up to about 20 kilometers depth um, uh, into this zone of <coughs> high uh, crustal velocities. And so what, what does that mean? Um, one possible interpretation is that we're looking here at a, 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 a slice where we're going from looking at a bright high amplitude moho that uh, is a result of a recent delamination, uh, transition into a gradational moho where the batholith is, is still in place transition into a, a relatively sharp moho where there's much less magmatic activity. And what this might be is the moho, the original moho into which the uh, batholithic magmas uh, intruded into uh, sort of uh, a, 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 along the edges of, of the batholith formation zone. So, the interpretation is that this is a relic moho. This used to be a moho that was down at 35 kilometers. And then uh, as the basalts uh, started uh, intruding into the lower part of this crust, uh, there was uh, 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 either sin or, or uh, very uh, uh, post-emplacement uh, uh, exhumation of the batholith. And uh, this uh, part of the mantle was, was uh, basically the zone of refinement and the residues formed underneath this pre-existing moho. Do you get any xenoliths there? Uh, there are no xenoliths from 
here. Uh, I'll show you in a later figure. There is a xenolith site. Um, I'll, I'll show you that later, OK? Are you going to talk about why this happened in the Miocene when the rocks are Cretaceous? This didn't happen in the Miocene. Well, the delamination is Oh, delamination is, yeah. Yes, yes. I will talk about that, yes. So just to overlay, overlaying these, uh, the surface wave tomography results, uh, there, there's a pretty good correlation between where we see uh, the, 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 this uh, sort of relic moho at the top of this uh, high velocity body. And, so, and then, but if you look at the surface wave tomography, you can see that the, um, the four point two or 4.3 contours pretty flat through here. And, and that's sort of the base of where we see the transitional moho. And so we think this is uh, basically the, the depth or the pressure at which the uh, eclogite transition goes to completion. It's, it's at a certain temperature, it's pressure dependent, right? So the residue above this pressure has lower velocities because that transition has not gone to completion. Or if it did go to completion, it, after it was exhumed, there was a, a retrograde reaction that, uh, uh, retrograde metamorphism that dropped the velocities above this depth level. And so, um, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but uh, petrologists, geochemists have and uh, and have been modeling the generation of these uh, intermediate silicic melts for a long time. There's all kinds of models out there, but I just wanted to show this one uh, that was published by Anna in all 2005 that looked. It's it's clearly an N-member model, but they modeled the formation of silicic intermediate melts by the intrusion of uh, a thick layer of basalt into the crust, ponding right at the base of the moho. Okay. And then they studied uh, uh, through a thermal chemical model how uh, the uh, thermal changing thermal regime would result in partial melting and uh, ponding and differentiation uh, of, of this column, basically. And basically, uh, uh, and it, it depends on what the initial model is and initial temperature and everything, everything. but basically it shows a, a, that uh, it generates a partial melt zone uh, by melting the, the base of the, of the, of the crust uh, right at the, at the base of the moho, and then the intruded basalt undergoes differentiation and, uh, and, and basically uh, generates uh, a, a crustal column that can possibly explain what we think the, the uh, batholith look like at the, at the depth of the seismic moho. Basically, it's a model for forming uh, uh, this relic moho. Yeah. There's also a really good paper by Defect and Bergantz. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. It's more complicated. <laughs> and, and its figures. It's into the yeah. yeah, okay. So uh, the idea is that if the moho acts as a primary density contrast that uh, uh, acts to. to to uh, 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 initiate differentiation of, of, of the, uh, and formation of the, of the root of the batholith, then over time, uh, uh, this discontinuity would be uh, associated, would still show up as a discontinuity, but with different uh, velocities across the, uh, across the discontinuity because of the, of the igneous and metamorphic processes that, that occur. And so this is just a, 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 a mod, uh, sort of a cartoon model 
of how you may, at, uh, what we may be looking at in this cross section is an evolution uh, from uh, a crust that has a relatively sharp moho uh, that was the initial lithospheric column into which the mag magma started intruding. And as we come into more the core of the batholith, we're looking at the entire column of the residue of the granitoid batholith. And as we come across the southern edge of it, we're looking at what happened after this residue was delaminated. Now, what I'm not going to get into is that this location right here where we see these high velocities is the top of what's known as the Isabella anomaly, a high velocity anomaly in the, in the mantle that extends a couple hundred kilometers deep underneath this location in the southern uh, uh, Great Valley. And uh, there are a number of discussions, ongoing discussions about whether this indeed is the ecclogitic root dripping down and sinking into the mantle or if it's a piece of remnant Farallon plate. And uh, maybe that's something that can be, uh, be discussed uh, later on. Um, OK, so um, yeah. Yeah. On that last slide, mm -hmm. the dashed line, you pointed out as sort of the, uh, the separation of where the ecclogite boundary was formed. Is that yeah, the, it's sort of the completion of the ecclogite so, so if boundary. So it's an yeah. an ecclogite feature, mm -hmm. and it goes above that uh, line. It doesn't so go above it, it goes deeper, it goes down. Okay, so it, it extended above it in one of the previous slides. So it starts with no. that line. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the shear velocities show that the, the shaded part kind of goes up a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that is part of the ecclogetic root that's preserved in the, in the, in the lower crust. So it's uh, ecclogetic where, there as well. Yeah, but uh, the Isabella anomaly is a term that seismologists use for the high velocity anomaly that's uh, sort of in the upper, upper mantle. And uh, so it's probably good to keep that as a, as a separate name for a particular seismic anomaly. What I'm suggesting that this shaded region is, is the residue root for the Syrian batholith that's still in place. Okay, I'm just okay. confused. So the, I should okay. interpret the entire thing as ecclogite? Yes. Or, uh, yes. And then what's, then what does the dashed line separate? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. The dash line is is a uh, shear velocity contour that's that's about 4.2 kilons per second, and so that that's equivalent to and it's at a at a depth that's sort of equivalent to the pressure at which this mafic residue would complete its transition to eclogite, to garnet peroxonite. Above it, it's uh, more of a gabbro norite, for example. It has the plagioclase is still stable. And so it's still part of the residue body, but it's at a depth level at which plagioclase is still stable. Below this depth, uh, plagioclase is it's at the base of the stability field of plagioclase. And so it's, there's no plagioclase. It's been replaced by pyroxenes and garnet. <laughs> I know, I know it's, it's approximately <laughs> isochemical, and it's just from different phases. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so a uh, question that uh, is often asked to people who think about these kinds of things is, uh, should a newly forming batholith with a thick residue reside at, at low elevations? And um, if, if garnet's present, present, it, it should, in fact, be very dense. And if it's part of the, the lithospheric column, it should be pulling down on the, on the, on the, crust, on the crust. And, and, and if, it, if that residue thickness is, uh, is sufficient, it should hold the, the crust down at relatively low elevations. But the answer to this question is actually complicated because 
uh, temperature and water content conditions are really important. And I just wanted to briefly show this figure from Tassara that shows uh, the predicted density profile for different compositions of uh, igneous uh, of material. Remember, uh, notice that this is only for the depth range of 20 to 70 kilometers. And th this is a density profile for, uh, uh, for an arc with a gabbro norite composition for anhydrous conditions. So if there is no melt or water present, this is the increase in density that you get from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the phase change uh, to eclogite. But if there's significant amounts of fluids present, in fact, that this is for a fluid <coughs> saturation condition, it, uh, it, it, it minimizes that, uh, it delays that change until a depth of about 50 kilometers. Okay. So the depth range at which these reactions occur are uh, apparently very dependent on uh, the presence of or absence of fluids. So that's a, a complication to, uh, to this story. Thank you. Does that explain it? Basically, you make nest balls, and they don't have the high density of the garnet. Though. So by having water there, instead of making garnet early, you can have amphibole, which doesn't have as high density. So it makes it takes a while until you get out of the garnet the amphibole story. That happens at 50 kilometers, presumably. <laughs> so, summary so far um, evidence from the uh, Sierra Nevada Bathley show that large volumes of eclogites formed during, hi during high flux events can be present in lithosphere. These formed during the formation of the Syrian Bathlith 90 to 100 million years ago. Why are they still there if they're really dense? And why did they not delaminate until uh, less than 10 million years ago? And the simplest answer I can give is uh, immediately after this flare up, uh, the arc was shut off by flat subduction. And if you have a flat slab subducting underneath, you can't, it can't drop off. It's being supported by, by the laramide flat slab. And it's only since the removal of the laramide flat slab, which uh, uh, started, you know, if, you, if you're a believer in the, in the flat slab, it was flat out to Montana. Right? And then it started rolling back. And as it rolled back, the ignimbri flare up initiated and propagated westward and southward across Nevada. And the last place where it rolled back is near the southern Sierra Nevada. And then that happened about 30 million years ago. It rolled back to that location about 30 million years ago. That also happens to be the time where the uh, uh, Mendocino Triple Junction uh, slab window started opening up. So between 30 and 25 million years ago, a lot of things happened that basically remove, uh, the, it was sort of the terminal part of the rollback of the laramide flat slab, opening of the, of the uh, 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 cessation of subduction south of the Mendocino Triple Junction, and then the Triple Junction started uh, near the latitude of uh, LA, and then the Triple Junction started migrating northward, and uh, basically it cleared the southern Sierra Nevada about depending on whose reconstructions you look at, about 15 to 20 million years ago. And so this dense root was supported by a flat slab until 20, 15 million years ago. 
that support was uh, then removed and it started uh, uh, delamination, started delaminating and, uh, some, and it actually delaminated presumably sometime between eight and two million years ago. And there's more involved stories involving uh, uh, looking at the volcanism that suggests that perhaps it occurred, uh, initiated closer to about four million years ago. But, um, so in the case of the uh, SNV, a combination of rapid post-emplacement exhumation, this post-emplacement exhumation also took a, apparent, if, if you believe this story, took a good chunk of that residue and put it into, uh, into the PT conditions where it, the, uh, where it was above the eclogite, the stability field. And so maybe part of it was, uh, was uh, preserved because of, because of that, that it, uh, it wasn't as dense as it could have been if it had all been uh, kept at depth. And, uh, and uh, this lower, the images that we're getting in the lower crust may represent a relic that moho that once represented the top of the batholith intrusion zone. Okay. So this is a good place to, to stop and, and take questions and, and um, take a breath. And <laughs> yes? Yeah, well, uh, what I, I think that uh, if, if this model is near, anywhere near correct, the previous MOHO represented sort of the, 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 the base of where the, uh, the main fractionation processes occurred. And, and so, and that also happened to be the depth at where, where the, the sharpest density contrasts were, were uh, present. And um, a, a, another part of the story for the delamination may be, and people have done some modeling of this, is that in addition to re the removal of the support from the flat slab, um, extension also initiated about this time, and extension may have played an important part in initiation, the initiate, initiating the delamination. And so there are models that suggest, uh, this is a whole nother area of uh, debate of how uh, delamination occurs. And there's two principal models. One is uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which is uh, basically a uh, gravitational instability that uh, is, is driven by uh, the fact that the lithosphere is denser than the asthenosphere, and that density inversion will, if you give it a, a little perturbation, will uh, build into a, into a uh, drip-like uh, removal process. And if if that's the only process going on, that would not necessarily predict a really sharp moho. But the other model of delamination is that there's a mechanical factor to it, and that uh, it may initiate as a Rayleigh-Taylor instability, but that, that initial uh, lithospheric thinning that's associated with that would be a, loca a weak location in which uh, um, asthenosphere or magma would come up to the moho and initiate a true delamination as Peter Bird defined it, which is a mechanical removal of the denser material from the less dense material above it. But the difference was that Peter Bird only talked about the mantle lithosphere, he never put the crust in. Yeah, yeah, but, he, uh, but uh, it, physically, mechanically, uh, the, the eclogite you can think of as having mantle properties, right? So it, 
Sure, it, so it didn't, but he didn't, he didn't talk, he, didn't, he wasn't thinking about eclogites, right? So oh, one, the, just before, uh, so in that model, you would expect a, uh, you would expect a relatively sharp location where the the delamination is localized, and as the sinus sphere comes in, it would uh, form a very sharp contrast between the remaining uh, more felsic part of the crust and the and the hot ultramafic material that comes in. It would it would form a sharp. Uh, interface or, yeah. There's a, a paper by Marinci and Gant, from, I think they were from Mount but I'm not sure, but they took um, a crust with a nonlinear rheology, so a little crust could flow, and then they put a little uh, side of guts or lithosphere, and then the senior structure, and then they just protrude the boundary mm -hmm. of the, lithos the base of the lithosphere. So what they got was almost inevitably you started you would start a really general stability, but because of the lower crustal geology, it rapidly evolved into um, a delamination effect. So that's nice because it reconciles these two models, which people hold religiously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've discovered this. Yes. Why, why would you expect the um, previous model to not produce uh, well-defined if, if it was just a linear uh, in, in the simpler, simplest models of Rayleigh Taylor instabilities, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a, 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 a boundary layer perturbation. So it, um, it only involves the lowermost part of the, of the dense material. So it's a much more gradational feature. And in theory, um, it, we, it can only produce like uh, the, the mantle material. Uh, the mantle material sort of forms a drip and uh, it thins out and then drips off and it, it, it leaves mantle material above it as well. It doesn't, it doesn't form a really sharp uh, discontinuity in the, between the material that it is, is removed and the material that remains behind. But as Alan mentioned, if, if you play around with the rheology a little bit, you can get drips to behave more like true delamination. But the one thing it does involve, it does require, is that you have to have a weak lower crust, basically, to, to allow the separation between the two. Um, there's a, a, seri a, people, a series of models uh, by um, Leticia, what, uh, what's her name? <laughs> La Poire, uh, thank you. Yeah, La Poire, and uh, uh, that she's modeled this in, in, in some, quite some detail. Some people think that it's too much detail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you mentioned lower crustal flows. Is that required because there's so much extension there? It really flattened out. It's extended quite a lot. So yeah, does that require lower crustal flow? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if it requires lower crustal flow. But if you look at these models by La Poirier, um, she does have. I mean, she has to have a weak crust in order to have the two separate. Uh, rather abruptly, and in her models, there's sig significant amounts of lower crustal flow during the delamination process. Yes? Is there a reason why you have the snow eastern wall and it's tilted, all that and it's tilted? Wouldn't that happen? Is that also the biasing? Does that make sense with. You're talking about the uh, eastern escarp escarpment of this? Uh -huh. You also expose the shallow, like shallow pitch on this. Right, because you had yeah. less erosion. On the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there's, yeah. The, so the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada, there's a, yeah, anybody that's driven into Owens Valley, it's a spectacular escarpment. Now, that, for the most part, represents, at least in the southern part of the Sierra Nevada, represents the the edge of the late Cretaceous batholith. 
uh, and but uh, and and so that is sort of the eastern edge where most people who model it put the eastern edge of the batholith that delaminated, but the delamination process uh, you know just doesn't occur right underneath it. It, it probably involves some extension, and uh, the and most. You know, there's a big normal fault there that allows isostatic, probably some isostatic uh, tilting. Uh, you know, that's where it's delaminated. A sphere is at shallow depth. And so the reason that there's high elevations there is not because there's thick crust, but there's really low density <laughs> upper mantle located right underneath the Sierra Nevada. And people have modeled that as well, I, and I think. People are, are, of course, this predicts a certain pattern of uplift in the Sierra Nevada. To the southwest first, and it also yeah. tilted to the west. Um, it was the tilted to the tail yeah. elevation by the southwest. Right, uh, but there's there's a lots of uh, controversy about the age of the up of the uh, uplift of the Sierra Nevada. That's a whole different discussion. Well, you now have two minutes. I think we could probably find time to do that again, to do the Andes in another Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely.